steadily increasing population growth in coastal zones globally is having a significant impact on the marine environment. As we build increasingly sophisticated defenses to hold the sea back, the features of natural shoreline habitats are lost, destroying ecosystems in their wake. Living Seawalls manufactures habitat panels designed to mimic formations like rock pools and mangrove roots, for example, two critical habitats for shore-based marine life to thrive. We're joined now by Mariana Maya Pinto, Senior Lecturer at UNSW Science and co-founder and co-leader of the Living Seawalls Initiative. Mariana, welcome. Tell us about how this initiative came about. Well, this is actually work based on more than 20 years of research, either done in Sydney or other parts of the world. So for 20 years, we have been documented impacts and realized that one of the main reasons that um, we are losing biodiversity on this built infrastructure is because they lack this complexity of natural habitats. Um, so, like a, a small scale experiments have um, shown that if we add these microhabitats on built infrastructure, we can potentially mitigate some of these impacts. So, living seawalls is simply like uh, putting this at a larger scale and due to Alex Gold from Reef Design Lab, making it very pretty and aesthetic pleasing for um, larger implementation, hopefully. Well, to set the scene for us, how big an impact has coastal construction had on native marine life and the loss of biodiversity? Yes, it's actually quite big and people don't realize. So our footprint now, all combined, all the infrastructure combined, which includes cables, uh, underwater cables, sea walls, um, marinas, aqua, aquaculture infrastructure, they now actually modify an area of the seafloor that is greater than the area of mangrove forest and seagrass beds combined. So it's actually pretty big. So what have you found? I mean, how successful is the repatriation of marine life after the seawalls have been installed? Yeah, we actually found extremely um, great results. Uh, we found that up to 30% more biodiversity on our living seawalls compared to unmodified seawalls. After two years, we actually found more than 100 species colonizing our living seawalls. So that's great news. So how are the walls maintained and monitored once they're there? We have uh, quite robust um, monitoring, scientific um, science monitoring going on. So we go and count everything, we photograph every six months. Um, initially on, on our site, we also compare to our reference site, which is our natural rocky shores and the and see walls that haven't been modified. And we do that uh, throughout the years. Did you get any resistance uh, when this was happening uh, in the early days uh, when you were getting things set up there in Sydney Harbour? Yeah, look, I wouldn't call resistance, but we were very aware of lots of some of the barriers that would exist. So even before the first installations, we actually did a workshop with a lot of stakeholders, which included engineers, industry, general public, local councils, and to try to understand their main concerns and perceived benefits. So that really helped us to you know, preempt some of those barriers before our first installation. Well, you are speaking to us from a, a city where it's been very successful in Sydney, but how much of an impact could living seawalls have in some of Asia Pacific's most polluted coastal and harbour cities, do you think? Yes, look, it's, it, we have to understand that it's not uh, miraculous, right? So if a place is really polluted, 
and nothing survives there. It doesn't matter how much habitat you provide, if there are no uh, species pool, right? There are no organisms there to colonize the living seawalls. So ideally, what we want is a more holistic um, way of manage this ecosystem. So if a place is really polluted, trying to manage the pollution as well as providing suitable habitat and potentially living seawalls could actually uh, help as well this pollution mitigation. So for example, in Sydney Harbour, we see a lot of recruitment from oysters and mussels, and they actually filter particles from the water and can help uh, improving water quality. So it's something that it could potentially be used as well as ways to mitigate pollution, but it needs to be done with other management actions. I mean, you're talking about harbour and coastal cities. What about uh, cities on rivers? Would the same concept work there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't know, potentially. We, we would need to understand a bit more the requirements of um, those habitats, those environments, so we can design appropriately. So the, the beauty of living seawalls is actually we design based on the local environment. So Sydney Harbour, we have been working here for decades. We know very well our initial designs were for there, but we are constantly making new designs, new panels, habitats, according to what we have found in with the science. And with Sydney Harbour, despite all the success that you've had, is there another step to take to make things even better when it comes to the maintenance of marine life? Oh, for sure. As I said, like still we need to ma like manage all the stormwater issues we have. Uh, hopefully halt constructions rather than uh, keep keep modifying natural habitats. Um, and yeah, but I have to say like we, we are very lucky. Sydney Harbour is still a hotspot of biodiversity in, in the world. We have lots of species. We actually have more fish species in Sydney Harbour than the entire UK coast. So we, we can't really complain.